Good morning. Nine minutes until I can say afternoon. We start a brand new series uh, today, Finding Faith in an Anxious Age. We also launch our 21 days of prayer and fasting today, which I'm extremely excited about. I want to talk about this idea of finding faith in an anxious age. We talk about um, when it comes to anxiety, we live in a world where we are constantly bombarded by information. We are surrounded by information. Um, our phones are connected. Our iPads are com connected. Our computers are connected. We have smartphones, smart TVs, and we even have smart fridges. Everything is smart. <laughs> Except us. <laughs> we all seem to be constantly getting more information, and the information does not make us wiser. It seems to just make us more anxious. Always concerned about what's happening around us. Just when we get over um, Australian fires, we hear about earthquakes in the Caribbean islands, and we hear about in earthquakes in Cuba and in Jamaica. Uh, we hear that a 41-year-old uh, NBA superstar dies tragically with his 13-year-old in a helicopter. Um, and just when uh, we get over that, uh, we, there's other information and um, news about what's happening around the world. For me, as an American, um, I, I, I watch every now and again the impeachment of Donald J. Trump and everything that's happening in that part of the world. It just seems that we just can't get over bad news. It's always happening. Just a couple of months ago, we were talking about the fires in Brazil. Everywhere is in trouble all the time. <laughs> and if that wasn't enough, in our own lives, trouble creeps up. And we have issues at work, and we try to leave it there. We try to wrap it up there, and we do like the, the great leaders do, compartmentalize what's happening. And then we come into our home, and then there's issues there. And uh, we leave home, and we go, okay, maybe at church. Certainly, everything should be peachy. And if you sit in the pews, most often it is. But when you get behind the scene, I call this the restaurant, where everything's pretty. Everything looks good. You have glass water brought to you, and all this stuff looks awesome. When you get into the kitchen, where the leadership talks and deals with issues, and there's teams. When you get into ministry teams, and you're serving, and you realize that Joe, who you used to sit through, isn't that nice? Everything, no matter where you are, seems like trouble keeps up. And then we have loved ones who are dealing with sicknesses and diagnoses and um, news of terminal illnesses. And yet we come here and we put our smart face on. But we have to admit that often we're breaking inside. And this series is really trying to get at how do I, in the midst of all of this, find faith? How do I grow my faith? How do I develop my dependence and trust in a God that I do not see when everything around me that I do see does not look hopeful? I don't know about you, but it's not that easy to believe in a mighty super God who loves us all when millions of animals have just burnt. I don't know about you. Maybe, maybe I'm the wrong. I don't know. It's not easy to believe in a sovereign God who can heal and can do almighty things and can, at a snap of his fingers, can restore people back to life again. Yet my wife, my mother, my sister, my aunt is going through a terminal illness, and I prayed, and it's not happening. 
finding faith in an age of anxiety, in an anxious age, learning to grow my faith in the midst of all of that. We haven't even talked about the distractions of social media and everything that's pulling us and pulling our attention. While all of this is happening, what we try to do is escape the pain with entertainment. And the entertainment pulls at us. And then when trouble hits and we don't know what to believe in, we go, I don't have time to find God. <laughs> this series is helping us practically try to figure out how do I find it. And here it is. I'm, I'm not going to be long today. By the grace of God, please pray with me. I'm not going to be long today because I just want to introduce this series there's so much to be said about Daniel, who's our topic, the person we're looking at today, who's our lens for looking at this. There's so much to be said in so many areas of his life that we could point out, but I really want to point out just a couple of things. Here's the main thing for me today. We have to understand that like Daniel, we too are exiles. Daniel was an exile. That means he was not at home. If we're going to grow faith, if we're going to understand faith, we have to believe this one thing, that the world as it is, is not as it should be. That's the first thing we must understand. That's the first principle here in this series that you have to understand, that you are in exile. This is not your home. And look, our home isn't in a mystical heaven, long, you know, Far, far away, our home is in a new earth, home as it should be. In order to get there, to understand that place, we must realize that when we encounter the things outside of us and when we encounter the issues that we're dealing with, we must come to the realization that this is not as it should be. We should not settle for this is just the way life is. Daniel and his friends teach us that. They too are in exile. Peter, one of the followers of Jesus, in his letter to the Christian church, he writes in 1 Peter verse 1, verse 2, chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. Here's, here's what he writes. He says, Peter, an apostle, just that just means the one who was sent an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, the chosen one of God, exiles. See what he calls you? Exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. I can't spend too much time because I promise I'm going to be short, but that by itself is a 10-part series. That by itself is a 10-part series. Not because uh, it's going to take me a long time um, to explain it, but it'll take you a long time to believe it. Because Peter basically says that you've been scattered, you're not at home, you're in a foreign land. Where you are isn't the way it should be. Something inside of you says this is not right. And the reason why something inside of you says this is not right is because you once knew what it was like. Why? Because I chose you based on my foreknowledge of you. I, I got to get to the sermon. I can't get to this. Okay, I'm just going to spend a little more time on that. <laughs> like, 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 like. Peter is saying that the reason why you're in exile and the reason why this doesn't feel like home is because you are once at home with God. And that God, knowing who you are, he knows you. Before you came here, he had foreknowledge of you. He knew you, understood you, experienced you. And therefore, because he knows you, he knows who you are, he chose you not based on what you will do, but based on who he knows you to be. That's deep. That's why it'll take 10 more weeks for you to believe it, because right now you're fighting it. Right? Is that what you really mean? <laughs> Based on his foreknowledge of you, he chose you. Woo! 
That's so good, because you know why? Because he's saying that he did not choose you based on your performance, your behavior, or your actions. He's not choosing you based on what you're doing. He chose you based on who you are. That's why before Jesus did any miracle, before Jesus did anything, he heard a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Why? Just because he is my son. If I was looking at Noah's behavior, I wouldn't like him very much. He doesn't let my wife sleep. But by virtue of who he is to me, I love him. I love him. And he could cry and yell and scream so that the whole neighborhood hears it. But I go, oh, you're so cute. I love you so much. Based on who he is. And so Peter says that, yes, you are in exile, but you're in exile because you have a home. And your home is with me. That's beautiful. That's the sermon right there. I should stop right there, really. Then he goes, listen. <laughs> you have a home. I know you. I knew you before you showed up. And because I knew you before you showed up, I chose you. So you're walking around as chosen. Every time you look at something and go, this isn't right, it's a sign of your chosenness. Woo! That's good. Every time you go, this isn't fair, this isn't right, this isn't just, nothing should happen like this, animals shouldn't be burned up like this, this isn't right, we must do something. Every time you feel discontent, it is a sign that you are not at home, therefore you are chosen. Woo! That's good. That's good. I walk out there like I'm, I'm happy about that. For knowledge of God the Father, then he doesn't stop there. He says, yes, I chose you. I know I chose you. But I know it's going to take some work. Through the sanctifying work of the Spirit. Ooh. I chose you. I called you. But I know I got to work on you. I got to change Noah's diapers. What do you guys call it? You guys call it nappies. It's been a year since I've been in Australia now, so I might as well just start saying it the right way. <laughs> nappies. I've got to bathe him, got to make him look good, got to dress him up. It's the work of parenting. I love him, therefore I make sure he looks good. I take care of him. God says, I chose you, and therefore I'm working on you through the Spirit sanctifying work of the Spirit, the sanctifying work of the Spirit. This is why we're pursuing after the Holy Spirit for 21 days. This is why we're saying to God, what we're doing by praying and fasting is we're opening ourselves up and we're saying, yes, parent me. When we open ourselves up to the Spirit, when we're fasting, we're not just refraining or withdrawing from food or something else. We're actually feasting on God. If all I do is don't eat or don't go on Facebook or don't watch TV or don't whatever it is you're going to do for the next 21 days, if all I do is don't do that, that's all I'm doing is I'm not doing that. I'm just starving. If I don't replace it by pursuing after the parenting of the Holy Spirit, I'm not fasting in the biblical sense. I'm just starving. But when I replace it and start feasting on God, that's when I'm fasting. Because fasting is feasting. It's not just what I'm not doing. It's what I'm doing in its place. Fasting is feasting. It's learning for 21 days. What you're saying is for the next 21 days, I want to open myself up to the power, the presence, the transforming, sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit who chose me before I was even born. That's what I'm doing. The sanctifying work of the Spirit to be what? To be obedient to Jesus Christ. The outcome of the work is obedience. 
to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. That's how powerful the blood of Jesus is. This takes a little sprinkle. We know what that means. Your mess is not as big as God's grace. Takes a little sprinkle. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. This is the part that we're going to deal with throughout this series. Notice how he, he ends that greeting. He says to a group of people in exile who feel that they're not at home, to a group of people who feel that they're out of place, my prayer for you is that you have grace and peace in abundance. That's what this series is about, finding faith in an anxious age to find the peace of God in abundance. In order to find the peace of God in abundance, there are some things we can learn from Daniel. Daniel teaches us the first thing you must do when you're in exile. That's what he was. He was in exile. He was taken away from his home in Judea. He was brought into Babylon, the empire, and he, at a young age, they said it couldn't, he couldn't have been uh, more than 20 years old. At a young age, he comes into a place, he finds himself not at home. He was top in his home, and now he's a servant in the Babylonian empire. And the first thing he does is he learns cultural discernment. What does that mean? We must, if we're going to grow our faith in this culture in this time in this digital age where information is thrown at us every time we must learn to discern the difference between God's word and my world the problem with Christianity today is that we try to make sense of God's word based on my world we let the world speak louder to us than what the word of God is saying and when the word of God Does it make sense based on the world I live in? I try to make the word of God twist and shape and move so it could make sense in my world. But if we're going to grow our faith, if we're going to become certain of who God is, we have to make sure that our ears bend towards the word of God and we make our world fit into God's word. Yet, 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 there's a crucial point here. Because growing up, this is the mistake we made. We tried to make people live in a world that we wish existed. We talked about a world that we wish, oh, you should do this and you should do that. But the reality is what they were saying to us didn't make sense based on the world that we lived in. So we, can, we cannot make the mistake of trying to live in a world as it should be instead of the world as it is. The truth is, the world that we live in looks nothing like the Bible we read. (laughs) It's drastically different. And so we have to learn to mine from the scriptures the principles that apply in the world today. Hence, our mission statement here at Burrow is reflecting Jesus here and now (laughs) in this world. Daniel teaches us how to do that because he helps us understand that, I, that, that you ought to learn. The first step is learning to rely on God rather than to rely on the wisdom of this age. Rely on God rather than to rely on the wisdom of the age. Second thing Daniel teaches us, that was Daniel 1. In Daniel 9, I'm going to go over them really quickly. In Daniel 9, Daniel teaches us that we have to act on the scriptures, act on the word that we're reading. Often the reason why the word of God doesn't make sense with the world we live in is because we don't act on the word of God. We simply read it, put it away. We look at our app, we read it, it looks good, okay. And if you're anything like me, you know, growing up in, in the Seventh-day Adventist tradition, I, I remember I, every, my, every morning my grandmother would wake me up 5 o'clock in the morning to do my Sabbath school. And I grew up going, okay, devotion, done. I did my, I did my reading for today. <laughs> but what I learned is if I'm not applying what I'm reading, then I'm not practicing trusting what God has said. So Daniel teaches in Daniel 9 that he's act, you have to actually act on the word that you're reading. And then Daniel 10, Daniel teaches us where we most of us fail as Christians, for those of us who already believe. And for those of us who are pursuing belief, 
often what happens is that we mess up because we try to get at point 10 or at step 10 without doing step one, step two, step three, step four, step five. What, what, what we don't do is we, we give up too quickly. Daniel teaches in Daniel chapter 10 that you must persevere in your pursuit with God through prayer, fasting, and scripture reading. You got to persevere. So relying on God, acting on his word, persevering in your pursuit. In doing that, you learn to rely on God's word more than the world around you. When I listen to the news, I listen to it drastically different than when most of my contemporaries listen to it. When I listen to the news and I hear what's happening, I hear it with different ears. Most people hear, oh, my gosh, and I say, oh, my God. Because I'm listening and I'm hearing what's happening based on what I see in the word. And so I'm depending on what I see and hear more than what the media is telling me out there. I hear impeachment. I hear God moves kings and leaders when he desires. I don't listen to it the same way. People go, Republican, Democrat, and I go, they're all the same. I listen to it differently. In Daniel chapter 1, I'm not going to go through all of it, but most of you know this story. And if you, if you grew up in the Seventh-day Adventist uh, faith tradition, um, you heard me listen, say it again, Sabbath school. It's a, it's a quarterly devotional book that you read all the time. It just so happens that we're studying the book of Daniel at the moment. So for those of you who follow that and do that, you probably would have, would have heard this story already. But in Daniel chapter 1, it talks about this idea where Daniel and his friends are brought into exile. Um, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, the, the king of the Babylonian empire, had a policy in which he would take people from um, foreign nations that he's overcome. He'd bring the best of the best back into the Babylonian world because he knows that his people, the Chaldeans who were ruling at the time, did not have enough cultural intelligence to go back and lead those places. So he would train them up in Babylon, send them back to the nations where they come from. And so he's brought a group of people, noble leaders, from those places, and he would take them young. Here's what the world knows that the church does not understand. This is for my church leaders. We spend all our money on adults. And we give our children the leftovers. We spend all our energy on adults. And we don't put enough resources in our kids, in our teens. And then we go, why aren't they here? The Babylonian Empire was its policy. They put all of their resources on young people. Because they wanted to train them up to become the future leaders of Babylon. So they would only take them when they're young. They said, the king says, go and find young men who look good. All right, Vaish? <laughs> Vaish is like, why would you say my name? <laughs> right, Chimongu? Yes, yes. Praise me. Be, be proud, girl. Be proud. <laughs> they said, go get young men who look good. Without any defect, Elena, that's your boyfriend description. That's the ad you should put out. No defects. <laughs> no flaws. Without any defect, make sure there's nothing wrong with them. And make sure they have an aptitude to learn, to understand things that are, that, are, that are vast in literature. Give them, make sure they have the ability to learn and to understand. Why? Because we're going to train them in the way of the Chaldeans. Now, it's not just in the way the Babylonians, it's in the way of the Chaldeans. The Chaldean people, their understanding was about astrology and understanding the signs and knowing what was happening in the world. So they were going to be trained as readers of the future. As wise men, I need you to understand, the Nebuchadnezzar is coming to train Daniel and his three friends on how to interpret the future through the signs that are happening. So Daniel comes into training. They feed them the best food. 
They changed his name, new identity. Hello. The thing is, you got you got to learn from these guys when they're tra- when they're changing you, you. They change you thoroughly. <laughs> new name. You don't even get to keep your old, your old name. New name is given. New identity is given. Your clothes are different. Everything about you changes. So Daniel has accepted a new name so far. He's accepted a, a, a new identity. He's brought into this new culture. He's given up who he is in so many ways. And then they say, okay, you're going to get the food. Okay? We're going to give you food from the king. And this is when Daniel goes, um, we need to have a talk. <laughs> so in Daniel chapter 1, he says, verse 8, But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. Not to defile himself this way. Not to corrupt himself this way. Daniel, you've accepted a new name. You, you, you've taken on the education of the Chaldeans. You've gone to their schools. You've taken everything. Why do you stop here? What's, what's the big deal? And now, now, for those of us who, who grew up in this church, we'll go, oh, it's because of the unclean meat. Certainly. It's because he didn't want to defile himself by eating food that's inappropriate. But he adds wine to it. And we know from the Jewish writings, wine was not unclean. So it's not just about eating unclean foods. Now, there are those who say, well, maybe it's not about unclean foods, but because it was at the king's table. And we know that food that comes to the king's table was first sacrificed to their God. So Daniel's going, I don't want, I don't want to defile myself with foods that were sacrificed to the God. But then he says, let me eat the vegetables. We know the vegetables were also sacrificed to the God. So it can't just be about that. Could it be that Daniel goes, you changed my name. You're teaching me your stuff. But I want to prove to you, there he goes, relying on God, that if I rely on God, I will survive and thrive off of less. If I trust in God, I will, I will thrive off of less with my God than you do with you feast when you feast on more. I will thrive with less with my God while you feast on more. And what I love about what Daniel does, he says, he says please don't let me define myself this way. The chief goes, I can't do it because, you know, the, the king, hey, if you, if you come out looking scrawny, If you don't come looking good, then guess what? It's going to be my head. And Daniel goes, all right, let's try this for 10 days. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Anxiety has to deal with what's happening around us. When we rely on God, we have to realize that it's what's happening within us that matters. What is the work that we're doing within? Faith is grown in privacy. This moment does not grow your faith. It's what you do outside of this place that grows your faith. Daniel does not go back to the king. He doesn't show up. He doesn't say, hey, king, here's what I'm doing. The king, King Nebuchadnezzar, doesn't even know Daniel's on a a different diet. This is between him and the chief priest. He changes his diet, and he goes without anything but vegetables, fruit, and water. And in 10 days, watch what happens. In 10 days, it says, listen, verse 15, at the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the world food. So the guard took away their choice food and the wine they were to to drink and gave them vegetables in, instead. Verse 17. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning, and Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. He's being trained to understand visions and dreams. 
But he's saying to the king, if I learn to rely on God more than I rely on what your diet is, I will show you that trusting God is more than your regiment, than your program, than the wisdom of this age. When Daniel stands before the king and his friend, he looks healthier and greater. And when you look at the end of the chapter, it says that there was no one like Daniel and his friends who stood up by something so simple, what they ate. It, it doesn't make, you know, you know what's so crazy about the Bible? Big things happen through small behavior actions. Big things. For 10 days, they just choose to eat vegetables and water. And in that little action, God goes, man, you trust me like that? I'm going to show up for you. And it's so crazy that an entire, based on the story of Genesis, the entire human project fell apart based on what they ate. And here Daniel's entire resume is built on what he ate. Daniel chooses, I'm going to eat differently. I'm going to eat differently than everyone else. And that sets him up for everything else that happens in his life. Because of his choosing to fast from the choicest of foods, to feast on God. We learn later that Daniel not only does this, but he prays three times a day and he gets in trouble for that too. In Daniel 9, in his reading of scripture, reading of Jeremiah, Daniel 9, verse 1 to 3, you, you see him reading the scripture of Jeremiah, and he goes, oh, wow, God said that in 70 years you'll get out of exile. So he goes to God, God, you said in 70 years we'll get out. Here I am. What's going on? What's happening? He, he's reading the word, and he goes to God, this is what you told me. Why is this not happening? That's the second practice. It's relying and acting on God's word. When's the last time you read your Bible and go, wait a minute, why isn't God doing this? <laughs> no, we justify it. Well, you know, that's not what God meant. And, you know, we live in a different world and this and that. And, you know, God literally said, trust me, <laughs> trust my word. It says in the Bible, ask and it shall be given. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be open. He says, don't worry about tomorrow because tomorrow worries about itself. But we are trained. The wisdom of our world is worry about tomorrow. What degree you're going to have? What class you're going to? I'm, I just graduated. They're asking me, so what are you going to do? Everything is about preparing for the future. The wisdom of the age is prepare for the future. Why? Because we can control it somehow. But Jesus tells us, listen, listen, live today. Trust me today. Depend on me today. When's the last time you read that Bible and applied it to something you're going through in that moment? In Daniel 10, I love what happens in Daniel 10. Daniel 10, he goes, God, 70 years, what happened? What's going on? He gets a vision. The vision scares him. <laughs> and so he just goes back. Talks about a great war, verse 1. So in verse 2, he goes down and he goes, Daniel mourned for three weeks. He decides for the next three weeks, I'm fasting. 21 days. Look at Daniel 3. I ate no choice food, no meat, no wine touched my lips. <laughs> he didn't even use lotion. Now, you know what's so crazy? Is that Daniel's able to do this now because he did it before. He gets to the point where the word says to him, something is scary about to happen in the future. And so he says, this does not look good. I'm going to go to God. He mourns and he prays for three weeks. He says to God, I've got to do something different. But he's only able to do it because he had spent 10 days. So for some of you, this 21 days might be day only one day of fasting. Because maybe you've never fasted before. Don't try to do 21. Don't be a hero. Start with one day. Daniel started with 10 days before he could do three weeks. But he spends these three weeks as a result of the dream he had. And so here's what Daniel teaches us. 
when you're pursuing after God, you don't stop when you get the first answer. You keep going until you arrive at where you're looking to be. If Daniel is looking for one thing, he's looking for peace from God. And so for three weeks, he fasted and prayed. And so for us, for the whole church, we must spend three weeks of praying and fasting. We're asking for the Holy Spirit to come into our lives and take place and help us grow these private disciplines. Remember, it's what I do privately that grows my faith. Faith is not something I can grow. Faith is something that is grown, and that is only grown by God. But it's how I'm in pursuit, how I'm opening myself to God that allows my faith to grow. So if I say I want to draw closer to God, but yet I just sit there waiting for God to do something about it, but there's nothing. I'm not opening myself up. I can't expect my faith to grow. Daniel does it by he, he acts on the word of God. He relies on God. He takes, he looks for opportunities where he can make a stand for God. And that's what he did. That food thing, he's like, okay, you're going to change my name. I can't change that. You forced me here. I can't change that. But what I eat, that's up to me. <laughs> what I eat, that's up to me. You're not going to make me eat that. What opportunities are you looking for this week? Where in this week are you going to take a stand and say, wait a minute, what you're saying doesn't make sense with what I believe. And that's how I grow my faith. I know some of you said you were praying for me. I don't believe you because I still went long. But I'm going to keep growing my faith. One day I will preach a short sermon. 21 week, 21 days, 21 days. You can choose to fast from food. You can choose to fast from social media. What I'm asking you to do is what is taking time from your life that you can put that time and invest it in pursuing after God? Second thing I'm asking you to do is choose, okay? I can do day one through 21, or I can do one, two, three, I can do one through five, or I can just do one. But our church is doing it for 21 days. You choose how long you want to go. Then choose the type of fast that you're doing. If you're going to fast from foods, you can choose to fast from one meal, just say, you know what, I'm going to eat everything, but I won't eat breakfast. I won't eat lunch. I won't eat dinner. Or you can, you can do like me, where you say, you know, I'm going to eat until sunset. You go from sunset to sunset, you go from sunrise to sunrise. Outside at our Connections desk, we have a, a practical guide for you on fasting. If you want to join us, we invite you to join us because we believe that if we do this together, believe great things can happen. Here's the thing. The reason why we do this stuff, we're opening ourselves up to God to grow our faith so that when trouble hits, we know how to respond. Daniel chose to stand up for God in a time of peace so that in the very next chapter, in chapter 2, where his life was in danger, he knew how to respond. So you've got to practice in order to prepare for when faith, your faith is going to be called into question. Would you practice now for the next 21 days? Let me pray with you. Father God, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your love. Lord, please be with us as we launch this 21 days of prayer and fasting as we pursue after you. We pray for your, the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit to work in our lives. Guide us, keep us, remain with us in Jesus' name.